I want to thank you for undertaking this mission. I know it's not simple, and you get um, inputs from many different angles and many different people, but I hope you find it interesting and worthwhile. I wish we could have conducted this interview in person, but we'll make the best of our present circumstances. Could you just tell the story of how Humbio got started, uh, you being more than almost anyone, uh, principal at the origin of the program? Um, one of the things that drew me to Stanford from a marvelous position I had at the National Institutes of Health was the unification of the medical school with the rest of the university. Uh, I thought President Sterling had um, just great courage and vision to see the potential of what you could do if you could link the research and teaching activities and service activities of the of the university, the general university, with the medical school. And that meant for us in the medical school um, a different kind of medical school in a way, because medical schools have historically been uh, isolated, often geographically isolated, and sometimes even when they're on the campus, they don't uh, work very closely with the rest of the university. And, Many of the key faculty, and particularly the new faculty, were uh, determined that we should find ways to collaborate in research, teaching, and service that would be more stimulating, more informative. And uh, for those of us in the medical school, it also gave us a chance to interact with undergraduate students um, for whom we had a high regard, but we really didn't know them very well. So. Um, so it was in that framework of the unification of the medical school of the university, particularly the humanities and sciences departments, which are most closely related to us, that, um, that I began thinking about um, uh, how we could take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I particularly talked with the late Joshua Litterberg, who was a dear friend and instrumental in recruiting me to Stanford, one of the great uh, biologists of the 20th century, and to Don Kennedy, who was then about as young as I was, or even younger, and uh, uh, we both had much bigger responsibilities than we'd had before. In any case, Letterberg, Kennedy, and I um, thought that it would be a very good idea to find meaningful ways to relate the medical school to the rest of the university. And um, we were struck by gaps in the curriculum for the undergraduates. Um, I should say that I had been engaged for several previous years in studies of the transition from high school to college, um, studies done at the NIH, and looking at the stressful aspects of the transition and coping strategies for overcoming these stressful obstacles. So I was particularly interested in the transition, and um, one of the things that um, struck me was that um, subject matters of great interest to the students as they entered college were matters they discussed only in the coffee house or whatever, but uh, but not not in a serious way in the classroom. It just wasn't in the curriculum, and. Um, that was uh, particularly fascinating to me and to Letterberg and Kennedy, all biologists, that we were just at the outset of the great breakthrough in molecular and cellular biology, which of course has advanced enormously since then. But even then, the, uh, the progress was very rapid and exciting. Um, but we wondered how that would be related, particularly for undergraduates, how it would be related, if at all, to the experience of human beings, of, of themselves as persons. And uh, uh, I contacted a number of universities to see what they were doing, and in essence, to oversimplify, the medical schools said, well, we do teach distinctively human biology, at least to a certain extent, in the context of clinical medicine, but we do not teach undergraduates. On the other hand, in biology departments and other um, 
departments of humanities and sciences. Their response, particularly in biology, typically was, we we're very excited about the new molecular and cellular biology, but we do not teach distinctively human biology. If that's to be taught here, it's to be taught by the medical school. So um, really important subjects uh, were not dealt with, either weren't dealt with at all or weren't dealt with in a very serious way, despite the fact that it was quite clear if you spent time with students informally that they had great interest in these matters. So um, Lederberg and I decided to try a one semester course. It was primarily his initiative, but he asked me to help him with it, and I did. We called it man as organism. Today we would undoubtedly call it the human organism, in order not to be sexist. But in any case, um, it was trying to bring in, to build upon, the new molecular and cellular biology in which he was such a pioneer and in which I had some involvement, um, to connect that with what was distinctive about human beings, uh, the various functional systems that uh, drew upon the cells and molecules of such interest, and um, in the relation of those functional systems to health and disease. So um, we found it a very enjoyable uh, enterprise, and the students responded uh, positively, much beyond our expectations. And um, so we thought that, um, that perhaps we should extend the course somewhat, but we were still thinking in terms of one course. However, the students in the course and their friends began to urge us and others to do more than that, um, to make a sequence of courses and, I don't know, within a year or so they were in effect demanding a major. It never had crossed our mind that we would undertake the scope of a major, a very big responsibility, very time-consuming, complex responsibility, but, but we could see the logic of dealing in an interdisciplinary way with uh, many elements of the new biology related to the old biology in some sense. Um, and we wanted, in a way, to have what you might call organismic biology, that is, what is distinctive about the human organism taken together. It's not a bag of molecules. How, how it is that the molecules and cells relate to the functional systems like like respiratory and cardiovascular and reproductive and so on. And then also beyond that, how those functional systems were related to disease. That brought up the question of the smoking and the respiratory system, smoking and the cardiovascular system. Um, it now seems so obvious um, in 2011, but in the early 1960s, it was not so obvious, and the amount of teaching done on those issues, the functional systems and disease, was uh, was really very, very small. So um, we felt that, um, that, in effect, this was a public health issue uh, that students from great universities should learn on a pretty broad scale about the different levels uh, of human organism, uh, from the molecule to the society, and, um, and learn the relation of that to uh, health problems and to other social problems, for example, the resolution of environmental questions, which is then as now only even more so uh, very controversial. So, um, so we did a certain amount of, of uh, teaching and uh, had some informal faculty seminars and involved some students and got very good student feedback. And there was a kind of ferment on campus that uh, 
we were moving in a direction that should be pursued, though none of us were terribly clear on just how to pursue it. Now, that came to the attention of the Ford Foundation, and there has been a misunderstanding in some of the communications from Stanford about that, uh, putting a man named Gordon Harrison at the center. Um, in some ways, Gordon Harrison was interested, but in the end, he hated the program, uh, and I'll have to explain that a bit. The real driving force behind it was a consultant, Lawrence Hinkle, professor of medicine at Cornell, who was a very active, dynamic consultant to Ford, and he heard about what we were doing, and he and I were old friends, and he contacted me and asked me if I could get together in a month or two a group of faculty from different disciplines at Stanford who might be interested in teaching together to make something like a human biology program. And I said, why wait a month or two? I think we could do it next week. I should emphasize to you that there were a number of faculty friends at Stanford who were looking for a reason to collaborate. And uh, we were delighted to have that opportunity. Um, to come back to what I said about Harrison, later on, and I'll come to it in a minute, his, virtually his whole budget on the staff of his section, whatever it was called, uh, it might have been called Health and Environment or something like that, was taken from him by the president, George Bundy, uh, for, to provide endowed chairs for Stanford. And Gordon Harrison did not like that at all. He lost his program and uh, he took a dim view of what we were doing. However, that's a minor point. He fundamentally understood it and was sympathetic. He just didn't want to lose his program. Um, it is true that around the time of the interest at Stanford, the Ford Foundation explored whether there might be similar interest elsewhere and got very little cooperation. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but um, other universities had a variety of reasons why they didn't want to invest the time and energy and perhaps aggravation in a human biology program of the kind that Stanford was planning. So we were, we were on our own, um, but we went ahead and planned a wonderful cooperation. I want to emphasize the spirit of Stanford, which I touched on already in speaking about Wally Sterling's vision and courage in moving the medical school to Palo Alto and, and urging tight connections between different parts of the university. It was also a very innovative spirit, I suppose on the world market the most conspicuous <coughs> example of that is what Stanford did to encourage the development of Silicon Valley. That was not the human biology program, but it, it does show that Stanford was very open to trying new possibilities and to try to work them out at a high level of, of quality. Um, so, so we had, in a way, the field to ourselves, and the, the faculty was very cooperative, the administration was very cooperative, the provost approved promptly, um, the president was supportive. So um, that was contradictory to what we'd heard from some of the other universities who did not want to explore the possibility because they were sure they would have great administrative and bureaucratic headaches and academic obstacles and whatnot, which had in case been, in fact, been the case at Oxford, England. That's neither here nor there. Um, we didn't have that. We explained as best we could what we were trying to do. We understood the tentative nature of it. Uh, we were not uh, making great demands uh, for money, some money, of course, uh, not making great demands for long-term commitments. We wanted to try it for a few years and see what we could develop and uh, come back to the faculty senate and other bodies from time to time uh, to get their approval and reapproval. So there was really no, uh, no difficulty about that. And we were just about ready to go when Josh Litterberg, who was a man of great foresight and also very strong convictions, decided that we 
should not go ahead without getting endowed chairs. Um, and the reason he gave was that we were all people of great intellectual curiosity and likely to move from one subject to another. He did not envision we would actually move away from Stanford uh, as much as we turned out to do later because uh, we all love Stanford. And in a way, it was a series of flukes that a number of us did leave. And I still to this day uh, very much miss Stanford, though I kept involved 15 years on the faculty and almost a decade on the trustees and involvement in various parts of the university over the years to the present time. But still, it wasn't a question of anticipating leaving Stanford, it was anticipate. Uh, Letterberg anticipated our changing interest in subject matter and types of courses. And therefore, if we wanted to have a program of enduring value, we should have endowed chairs. Now, the policy of foundations at that time was essentially no endowed chairs, with very rare exceptions. But we made an effort with Ford, which was, I believe, the largest foundation at that time. And some of us, particularly Don Kennedy, uh, knew McGeorge Bundy, the president, and an irony is the last six years of McGeorge Bundy's life he spent with me as a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Corporation in New York, the old original general purpose foundation that I headed for 15 years. Um, and um, but he, uh, uh, we didn't have such a close relationship at the time of the human biology origin. Rather, he saw the logic of um, having some endowed chairs so that you would have the security of uh, continuing the program uh, with different faculty members in different configurations and so on. Um, and therefore, he agreed to four endowed chairs provided that Stanford would match. Stanford did match, not all at once, but contacted individuals who uh, were likely to be interested, and a number of them were. And so we had four endowed chairs in a short time, much to our surprise. But it also gave great encouragement that the funding for the program might, uh, might well be positive, even over and above the, the endowed chairs. But it was a shock at the time. Most of us were, frankly, irritated with Letterberg, thought he was um, complicating matters but he uh, turned out to be right. Um, now, uh, but I, I've already stated most of the heart of the matter, that is, we wanted to be interdisciplinary, but not just interdisciplinary within one part, even major part of biology, but rather essentially the whole of biology, the life science. So it was a it was an integrative connection of the, what in some terminology would be the biological and behavioral sciences, although we considered human behavior one of the most important things that people do. It's how we adapt, how humans have adapted, and therefore it's very much a part of the life sciences. Uh, it didn't mean that we were comprehensively going to cover the behavioral and social sciences, but we wanted a substantial sampling to go with the um, the um, uh, biological with the uh, uh, more fundamental and, and reductionistic parts of uh, biology. They were very intrigued. Uh, the psychologists were intrigued with the emergence of the new biology. Sandy Dornbush in sociology likewise. And, um, and some biologists were intrigued with the fundamental concept I mentioned earlier that, that one of the most important things human organisms uh, do for adaptation is their action and behavior, and that's not just a bag of molecules. I'm a little curious about the support from the administrative side of the university at the outset. Not necessarily in the response to the money from the Ford Foundation, but just in general, once this program got um, a green light, how was it supported logistically and by deans and provosts or whoever it was that was involved in that period. My feeling was that uh, there was a high level of congeniality about learning from each other, 
individually and uh, and through some parts of our departments. I don't think any of us insisted that members of our departments all participate. Um, there were several department chairmen, including myself, and we encouraged our people to participate. Uh, maybe you'd say we bootlegged a little bit in the sense that our department would pay the salary for some part-time in which the faculty member would, uh, uh, would devote to uh, human biology for a while until we were adequately funded. But that was, uh, we were happy to do that and the administration was happy for us to do it if we wanted to, to shift some funds around that, uh, that dealt with issues that were pertinent both to our fundamental, especially like psychiatry and pediatrics on the one hand and uh, to human biology on the other, that was, that was okay. We didn't, at least I'm not aware that we encountered any serious objections on that, on that front. But we were very lucky to have in administrative positions people like Al Hastar, also a person who's not so much mentioned in the literature that I've received from Stanford is Jim Gibbs, who I think his position was Dean of Students. That may have even been a new position. I, I can't swear to what the position was, but he was some kind of dean concerned with undergraduates, which was an important focus for us to give a more deliberate attention to the experience of the undergraduate. And uh, Jim Gibbs was a um, very distinguished uh, African-American anthropologist, a trustee of Cornell University, and a wonderful teacher. So he and Hastarf were in administrative positions that uh, both uh, uh, took part in the teaching and helped us along with the program as a whole. Can you say something more directly about the time after you had left Humbayo, but were um, supporting from afar through the Carnegie Corporation the efforts of the program to create the uh, life sciences middle school curriculum. When I went to Carnegie, spent 15 years as president there, I um, one of the things that I did was to focus on adolescence. Adolescence seemed a, a crucial time for learning, well, human biology, among other things, uh, with the changes in the body related to puberty and the social changes that surround the expectation from being a child to becoming an adult over a period of years. Um, there is an enormous amount of curiosity and perplexity that adolescents feel about you know, what's happening to me and what can I do with my life in the long run and um, what can I believe even. So um, we felt we had a, a first a task force on that and then a 10-year Carnegie Council on Adolescent Development that I chaired, which had Eleanor Maccabee from Stanford on it and Betty Hamburg, from Stanford, formerly of Stanford on it and uh, a number of distinguished scholars as well as national figures uh, like Ted Koppel of ABC and Admiral Watkins who was then heading the Navy. It was a mixture of, of uh, national leaders and uh, scholars and scientists, uh, Fred Robbins and Abellis who worked on the polio virus. Anyway, um, the point is that we, we wanted in this adolescent council over those years to lay out the different aspects of adolescent development, what's stressful about it, what are the coping strategies, what are the health considerations, what can you do about those. So it was probably the most prominent activity of that kind there's ever been on adolescents. We had a number of national and international meetings that had high coverage. We tried to get high visibility, high quality coverage of meetings that would draw public attention to these issues and try to generate better ideas, always stimulating to the extent we could uh, universities and community organizations to generate better ideas. But the time seemed ripe in this movement from childhood to adolescent to, to toward adulthood and with the physical changes of adolescence uh, to pursue the human biology 
uh, dimensions. And therefore, I asked Craig Heller and Mary Kiley. Mary Kiley had been working with us at Carnegie. I asked them to see if their colleagues in human biology and my former colleagues in human biology would be interested, and they were. There was a great deal of cooperation. For example, Haran, Haran Kachaturian put in a lot of time in writing materials uh, for, the, for the middle grade schools. Uh, we also felt that the, the middle grade schools, the junior high, never had an organizing principle. It was meant to sort of soften the transition from elementary to high school, and instead uh, it had some counterproductive effects. So it needed organizing, one or more organizing principles, and it needed to have some intellectual coherence, and a human biology program um, went a long way in that direction. I think the faculty did a brilliant job. However, they encountered political obstacles. Um, political obstacles we see today with adults, but at that time they were less strenuous with adults than they are with uh, adolescents. That is, can you teach about sexuality? Can you even teach about smoking? I mean, there were all kinds of objections to this or that. The main things were um, teaching human evolution, which of course is the core. Evolution is the core of biology. You can't get away from that. Um, and um, uh, teaching evolution and teaching uh, reproductive biology were the two main objections that they encountered. And therefore, textbook publishers backed off. I can't tell you the details, but it was very hard. I made efforts and with some success to get uh, publishers to take a serious interest in this, but they were so afraid the controversy that would be generated. And as you may know, some states, like Texas being the most prominent, have an extraordinary influence on the textbooks adopted at the junior high level and even the high school level throughout the country. So um, it's, um, it was a struggle. I, mean, I, I think there's no doubt that those who participated, I certainly feel it was the right thing to do. It was a good idea, it was highly innovative. It met a great need, but um, but as with almost all important uh, social problems, there are political and ideological obstacles, and uh, they had to fight their way pretty hard to do what they did in that uh, program. And I, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. And my guess is, in due in due time, um, the more and more information of the human biology sort uh, will seep into the curriculum of the middle grade schools. I'm talking in a practical dimension, not so much the intellectual one. How have the efforts of the program directly influenced public health? Oh, I think on the whole we've changed behavior for health in a positive direction over the past 30, 40 years. Um, you know, some things more than others, the cigarettes, as you mentioned, are the best example. But I think the general trend overall is toward taking that kind of information more seriously. Uh, there is some argument about what role the government should play. Now, there's not, so far, there's not been an appreciable argument about um, great research institutions like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, which generate much of the information that ultimately bears on the disease. And there's a tremendous desire for the academic health centers to make innovations in surgery and radiology and whatnot, uh, psychiatry to, uh, uh, to improve treatment and even get to prevention. So those things are taken for granted as having a heavy uh, governmental responsibility uh, to support things that will improve health and not just health, but will improve the human condition. But um, but there are there is right now, for whatever reason, at this moment in 2011, um, a um, I'm tempted to say a climate of hatred, um, which may have something to do with. Uh, 
has a lot to do with uh, political considerations, of course, but um, uh, that climate of, of hatred has been applied to government, and yet, just not within the past year or so, there was an additional passage of a Food Safety Act. Um, I take an interest in that because my daughter is commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Um, quite a bit of it was in bipartisan support, quite a bit of money was put into it. People care about the safety of the food they eat every day. It bears directly on their well-being. There's nothing abstract about it. And the polls show that about 80% of American people favor the Food Safety Act. Yet at this moment as we speak, I understand there's some doubt whether Congress will fund it or fund it uh, at the level that was originally envisioned. Um, in my mind, it's, it's uh, irrational, political, ideological, but I don't think that will last forever. Uh, if you had a severe outbreak of food poisoning of some kind, you'd probably get a very strong response. Why don't we give the government more funds to prevent such epidemics? But how many disasters does it take to uh, um, to respond in, in that way? In the current climate, there are some virulent reactionary uh, responses to government intervention in health in any way at all, like Obama's wife's promotion of play or more healthy diets. Um, uh, uh, the president has himself direct address to schools. Some things that would not be considered controversial, I feel, have become more than they would have been in the past. Can you comment on that just for your, from your broader experience of how those are responded to by Washington or public health officials or the political base of either party in your lifetime? There's an enormous amount of wishful thinking. Never underestimate the power of wishful thinking in human experience. And uh, wishful thinking about uh, how you can maintain health or prosperity or security uh, with a minimal uh, government role is uh, at, at today most very prevalent. Uh, it wasn't always so prevalent. And the world would be much, much worse off had that been an accepted doctrine. Um, I remember as a kid, it was an accepted doctrine in Indiana where I grew up in the most severe isolationism. So that, for example, I never thought I'd get to Europe. I was like going to the moon. It was a tremendous objection to our messing around with other countries who were disillusioned after World War I and had a severe dose of isolationism and as a consequence, almost lost the world to the great dictators. So, um, never underestimate the power of wishful thinking. Uh, the voice of rationality is small but persistent, as Freud said one time. And um, I, <laughs> I like to think that that will apply in, uh, in many areas. What challenges do you see facing human biology? Um, or opportunities uh, in the near future? In the... Um, in the human biology area, uh, I do think there is actually a lot of curiosity. Uh, I, I, I'm not talking about just about the course, but about human biology in general. A lot of curiosity, um, a lot of fascination with the new developments. At the same time, there's some fear, very important, that, that it be linked with uh, ethical considerations and uh, and a very frank analysis of what the dangers are in every sphere. So I, I think that on the whole, coming back to the human biology program, we really tried to do that um, to, you know, appraise both benefits and, uh, and dangers. Uh, and I, I would guess that that's still the case. Why has the success of human biology at Stanford not been more greatly replicated elsewhere? 
Well, I, I have been surprised that so few universities have developed HumBio programs. Uh, I thought that the logic of it was so compelling and the success at Stanford so manifest that it would spread. But it turns out that it's been difficult to do. Only a handful of universities, some people, one person recently told me three, I don't know. Uh, I think what you have is maybe three or four full-blown human biology programs and probably, I don't know, as a guess, 10 or 20 partial human biology programs. Um, but it's certainly, it's certainly not a, an epidemic as I had thought might occur over, not immediately, but over a 20, 30 year period. Um, a lot of it seems to be difficulty in getting faculty cooperation. That the, um, uh, there's so many stovepipes and the desire to do your own thing and get recognition for your accomplishment in science and to concentrate on research rather than teaching. And in teaching, to concentrate on postdocs rather than graduate students and graduate students more than undergraduates. So there are a lot of faculty problems that I think impede the level of cooperation that you need and the keen awareness and appreciation of the different disciplines that we have achieved at Stanford and I think eventually will achieve much more broadly. But looked at it another way, it's very much to Stanford's credit. Stanford is one of the very few places that has been able to do this. Not only did we create the first one, but we've been able to sustain it over 40 years uh, when so many other universities have wanted to. I've talked with several excellent university presidents, including one who was uh, from Stanford, um, who said they just couldn't get the cooperation from their faculty to do what needed to be done. So we have at Stanford been able to do that, and it, I think in considerable part, reflects the continuing openness and ingenuity and spirit of innovation that has characterized Stanford um, from the start. Can you recall for the reunion any encounters with alum over the years or recently um, where the you know, previous student r recalls themselves what their experience was in the program? Well, I had a very funny experience just this past week. Um, I was um, getting out of a taxi in front of my daughter's home where we live now and there was a young woman jogging with a Stanford uh, t-shirt and I said, are you really from Stanford? And she looked at my cap, which is a Stanford cap, protecting against the Washington sun. She said, yes, I'm really from Stanford. And are you? She said, what class were you in? Well, I wasn't a student, but I was on the faculty there. Oh, what did you do on the faculty? I said, well, I was one of the founding fathers of something called the Human Biology Program. And she screamed. She said, my God, I was a human biology major. I've just graduated. I'm going to medical school at Vanderbilt next year. It's the greatest experience I've ever had, maybe the greatest experience I'll ever had. So with very intense and passionate um, appreciation of the program, it was as if we'd known each other for many years, uh, both caring so much about this program, despite the disparity in our ages. Uh, I, w I would add to that that it's uh, not unusual for me to run into people, particularly when I was living in New York, um, who recognized me from the human biology course, who'd been, who'd been human biology majors and who now are working on Wall Street or doing something else. Many of them, of course, went into life sciences or into medicine or public health, but many didn't. And uh, uh, the reactions have been very similar to this one I described, not quite as intense, but what a powerful experience it was, how valuable, uh, entered into it with some skepticism, came out um, uh, with a kind of positive transformation. So um, those experiences, of course, are very gratifying. I have no illusion that everybody came out that way, but a large proportion did.